Dedication by Eugene Field. Read for LibriVox.org by Kangaroo. Why do the bells of Christmas ring? Why do little children sing? Once a lovely shining star, seen by shepherds from afar, gently moved until its light made a manger's cradle bright. There a darling baby lay, pillowed soft upon the hay, and its mother sung and smiled, This is Christ the Holy Child. Therefore the bells for Christmas ring, therefore little children sing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Christmas Hymn by Eugene Field Read for LibriVox.org by Kangaroo Sing, Christmas bells, say to the earth, this is the morn, whereon our Saviour King is born. Sing to all men, the bond, the free, the rich, the poor, the high, the low, the little child that sports in glee, the aged folk that tottering go. Proclaim the morn that Christ is born, that saveth them and saveth me. Sing, angel host, sing of the star that God has placed above the manger in the east, Sing of the glories of the night, the virgin's sweet humility, the babe with kingly robes bed tight. Sing to all men, where'er they be. This Christmas morn for Christ is born, that saveth them and saveth me. Sing, sons of earth, O ransom seed of Adam, sing. God liveth, and we have a king. The curse is gone, the bond are free, by Bethlehem's star that brightly beamed. By all the heavenly signs that be, we know that Israel is redeemed, that on this morn the Christ is born, that saveth you and saveth me. Sing, O heart, sing thou in rapture this dear morn, whereon the blessed prince is born. And as thy songs shall be of love, so let my deeds be charity. By the dear Lord that reigns above, by him that died upon the tree, by this fair morn whereon is born, the Christ that saveth all and me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Symbol and the Saint of Christmas Tales and Christmas Verse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christmas Tales and Christmas First by Eugene Field The Symbol and the Saint Once upon a time, a young man made ready for a voyage. His name was Norse. Broad were his shoulders, his cheeks were ruddy, his hair was fair and long. His body betokened strange, and good nature shone from his blue eyes and lurked about the corner of his mouth. Where are you going? asked his neighbor John, the forge master. I am going sailing for a wife, said Norse. For a wife, indeed, cried Johns. And why go you to seek her in foreign lands? Are not our maidens good enough and fair enough that you must need search for a wife elsewhere? For shame, Norse, for shame. But Norse said, A spirit came to me in my dreams last night and said, Launch the boat and set sail tomorrow. Have no fear, for I will guide you to the bride that awaits you. Then standing there, all white and beautiful, the spirit held forth a symbol, such as I had never before seen, in the figure of a cross. And the spirit said, By this symbol shall she be known to you. If this be so, you must need go said johns but are you well fixed old come to my cabin and let me give you venison and bear's meat nor shook his head the spirit will provide said he i have no fear and i shall take no care trusting in the spirit 
so norse pulls his boat down the beach into the sea and leap into the boat and unfurled the sail to the wind john stood wandering on the beach and watched the boat speed out of sight on on many days on sailed norse so many leagues that he thought he must have compassed the earth in all this time he knew no hunger nor thirst it was as the spirit had told him in his dream no cares nor dangers beset him by day the dolphins and the other creatures of the sea gambled about his boat by night a beauteous star seemed to direct his course and when he slept and dreamed he saw ever the spirit clad in white and holding forth to him the symbol in the similitude of a cross at last he came to a strange country a country so very different from his own that he could scarcely trust his senses instead of the rugged mountains of the north he saw a gentle landscape of velvety green the trees were not pines and firs but cypresses cedars and palms instead of the cold crisp air of his native land he scented the perfumed zephyrs of the orient and the wind that filled the sail of his boat and smote his tan cheeks was heavy and hot with the odor of cinnamon and spices the waters were calm and blue very different from the white and angry waves of norse native fjord as if guided by an unseen hand the boat pointed straight for the beach of this strangely beautiful land and near its prow cleaved the shallowest waters nor saw a maiden standing on the shore shading her eyes with her right hand and gazing intently at him she was the most beautiful maiden he had ever looked upon as norse was fair so was this maiden dark her black hair fell loosely about her shoulders in charming contrast with the white raiment in which her slender graceful form was clad around her neck she wore a golden chain and therefrom was suspended a small symbol which norse did not immediately recognize hast thou come sailing out of the north into the east asked the maiden yes said norse and thou art norse she asked i am norse and i come seeking my bride he answered i am she said the maiden my name is Faya. an angel came to me in my dream last night and the angel said stand upon the beach today and nor shall come out of the north to bear thee home a bride so coming here i found thee sailing over shore remembering then the spirit's words nor said what symbol have you Faya? that i may know how truly you have spoken no symbol have i but this said Faya, holding out the symbol that was attached to the golden chain about her neck norse looked upon it and it was the symbol of his dreams a tiny wooden cross then norse claps Faya in his arms and kissed her and entering into the boat they sailed away into the north in all their voyage neither care nor danger beset them for as it had been told to them in their dreams so it came to pass by day the dolphin and the other creatures of the sea gambled about them by night the winds and the waves sung them to sleep and strangely enough the star which before had led norse to the east now shone bright and beautiful in the northern sky when norse and his bride reached their home 
Jones, the forge master, and the other neighbors made great joy, and all said that Faya was more beautiful than any other maiden in the land so merry was jans that he built a huge fire in his forge and the flames thereof filled the whole northern sky with rays of light that danced up 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 to the star singing glad song the while so norse and fire were wed and they went to live in the cabin in the fir grove to this too was born in good time a son whom they named Klaus. On the night that he was born, wondrous things came to pass. To the cabin in the fir grove came all the quaint, weird spirits. The fairies, the elves, the trolls, the pixies, the fathers, the cryans, the goblins, the kobolds, the moss people, the gnomes, the dwarf, the water spirits, the corals, the bogles, the brownies, the nixies, the trolls, the style folk, all came to the cabin in the fir grove, and capered about and sang the strange, beautiful songs of the mist land. And the flame of old John's fort leaped up higher than ever into the northern sky, carrying the joyous tidings to the star, and full of music was that happy night. Even in infancy, Claus did marvelous things. With his baby hands, he wrote into pretty figures the willows that were given him to play with. As he grew older, he fashioned with the knife old John's had made for him many curious toys. Carts, horses, dogs, lambs, houses, trees, cats, and birds, all of wood and very like to nature. His mother taught him how to make dolls too dolls of every kind condition temper and color proud dolls homely dolls boy dolls lady dolls wax dolls rubble dolls paper dolls words dolls rag dolls dolls of every description and without end so klaus became at once quite as popular with the little girl as with the little boys of his native village for he was so generous that he gave away all these pretty things as fast as he made them. Klaus seemed to know by instinct every language. As he grew older, he would ramble off into the woods and talk with the trees, the rocks, and the beasts of the green wood. Or he would sit on the cliffs overlooking the fjord and listen to the stories that the waves of the sea loved to tell him. Then too he knew that the hounds of the elves and the style folk and many a pretty tale he learned from these little people. When night came, old Johns told him the quiet legends of the north, and his mother sang to him the lullabies she had heard when a little child herself in the far distant east. And every night his mother held out to him the symbol and the similitude of the crows and bade him kiss it ere he went to sleep. So Klaus grew to manhood, increasing each day in knowledge and in wisdom. His works increased too, and his liberality dispensed everywhere the beauteous things which his fancy conceived and his skill executed. Johns, being now a very old man and having no son of his own, gave to Klaus his forge and workshop, and taught him those secret arts which he in youth had learned from cunning masters. Right joyous now was Klaus, and many, many times the northern sky glowed with the flames that dawned singing from the forge while Klaus molded his pretty toys. Every color of the rainbow were these flames, for they reflected the bright colors of the beauteous things strewn round that wonderful workshop. Just as of old he had dispensed to all children alike the homelier toy of his youth. So now he gives to all children alike these more beautiful and more curious gifts. So little children everywhere love clothes, because he gave them pretty toys 
and their parents loved him because he made their little ones so happy. But now Norse and Vaya were come to old age. After long years of love and happiness, they knew that death could not be far distant. And one day Vaya said to Norse, Neither you nor I, dear love, fear death. But if we would choose, would we not choose to live always in this our son Klaus, who has been so sweet a joy to us? Ay, ay, said Norse. But how is that possible? We shall see, said Fire. That night, Norse dreamed that a spirit came to him and that the spirit said to him, Norse, thou shalt surely live forever in thy son Klaus, if thou wilt but acknowledge the symbol. Then when the morning was come, Norse told his dream to Faya, his wife, and Faya said, The same dream had I, an angel appearing to me and speaking these very words. But what of the symbol? cried Norse. I have it here, about my neck, said Faya. So saying, Vaya drew from her bosom the symbol of wood, a tiny cross suspended about her neck by the golden chain, and as she stood there holding the symbol out to Norse, he thought of the time when first he saw her on the far distant Orient shore, standing beneath the star in all her maidenly glory shading her beauteous eyes with one hand and with the other clasping the cross the holy talisman of her faith fire fire cried norse it is the same the same you wore when i fetched you a bride from the east it is the same said fire Yet see how my kisses and my prayers have worn it away. For many, many times in these years, dear Norse, have I pressed it to my lips and breathed your name upon it. See now, see what a beauteous light its shadow makes upon your aged face. The sunbeams, indeed, streaming through the window at that moment, cast the shadow of the symbol on old Norse's brow. Norse felt a glorious warmth suffuse him. His heart leaped with joy, and he stretched out his arms and fell about Faya's neck, and kissed the symbol and acknowledged it. Then likewise did Faya, and suddenly the place was filled with a wondrous brightness and with strange music, and never thereafter were Norse and Faya beholden of men. Until late that night, Klaus toiled at his forge, for it was a busy season with him, and he had many, many curious and beauteous things to make for the little children in the country roundabout. The colored flame leaped singing from his forge, so that the northern sky seemed to be lightened by the thousand rainbows, but above all this voiceful glory beamed the star, bright, beautiful, serene. Coming late to the cabin in the fir grove, Klaus wondered that no sign of his father nor of his mother was to be seen. Father? Mother? He cried, but he received no answers. Just then the star cast its golden gleam through the lattice window, and this strange holy light fell and rest upon the symbol of the cross that lay upon the floor. Seeing it, Klaus stooped and picked it up, and kissing it reverently, he cried, Dear talisman, be thou my inspiration evermore, and wheresoever thy blessed influence is felt, there also let my works be known henceforth forever. No sooner had he said these words than Klaus felt the gift of immortality bestowed upon him, and in that moment too, 
there came to him a knowledge that his parents prayer had been answered and that norse and fire would live in him through all time and lo to that place and in that hour came all the people of mistland and of dreamland to declare allegiance to him yes the elfes the fairies the pixies all came to close prepared to do his bidding joyously they capered about him and merrily they sung now has ye all cried close has yield to your homes and bring to my workshop the best ye have search little hill people deep in the bowels of the earth for the finest gold and choicest jewels fetch me o mermaids from the bottom of the sea the treasures hidden there the sails of rainbow thins the smooth bright pebbles and the strange ocean flowers go pixies and other water spirits to your secret lakes and bring me pearls speed speed you all for many pretty things have we to make for the little ones of earth we love but to the cobbles and the brownies claus said fly to every house on earth where the cross is known loiter unseen in the corners and watch and hear the children through the day keep a strict account of good and bad and every night bring back to me the names of good and bad that i may know them the cobbles and the brownies laughed gleefully and sped away on noiseless wings and so too did the other fairies and elves there came also to close the beasts of the forest and the birds of the air and bade him be their master and up dawns the four winds and they say may we not serve you too the snow king came sailing along in his feathery chariot oh ho he cried i shall speed over all the world and tell them you are coming in town and country on the mountain tops and in the valleys wheresoever the cross is raised there will i herald your approach and thither will i strew you a pathway of feathery white ho 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 so singing softly the snow king stole upon his way but of all the bees that baked to him surface claws like the reindeer best you shall go with me in my travels for henceforth i shall bear my treasure not only to the children of the north but to the children in every land whither the star points me and where the cross is lifted up so said claws to the reindeer and the reindeer neigh joyously and stamped their hoofs impatiently as though they longed to start immediately oh many many times has claus whirled away from his far northern home in his sledge drawn by the reindeer and thousands upon thousands of beautiful gifts all of his own making has he borne to the children of every land for he loved them all alike and they all alike love him i trow so truly do they love him that they call him santa claus and i am sure that he must be a saint for he has lived this many hundred years and we who know that he was born of faith and love believe that he will live forever End of the symbol and the saint. Christmas Eve by Eugene Field, recorded for LibriVox.org by Kangaroo. Oh, hush thee, little dear, my soul! The evening shades are falling. Hush thee, my dear! Dost not thou hear the voice of the master calling? Deep lies the snow upon the earth, but all the sky is ringing with joyous song, and all night long the star shall dance with singing. Oh, hush thee, little dear, my soul, and close thy eyes in dreaming, 
and angels fair shall lead thee where the singing stars are beaming a shepherd calls his little lambs and he longeth to caress them he bids them rest upon his breast that his tender love may bless them so hush thee little dear my soul whilst evening shades are falling and above the song of the heavenly throng thou shalt hear the master calling end of poem this recording is in the public domain Joel's talk with Santa Claus of Christmas tales and Christmas verse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christmas tales and Christmas verse by Eugene Field. Joel's talk with Santa Claus. One Christmas Eve, Joel Baker was in a most unhappy mood. He was lonesome and miserable. The chimes making merry Christmas music outside disturbed rather than showed him. The jingle of the sleigh bells fret him, and the shrill whistling of the wind around the corners of the house and up and down the chimney seemed to grate harshly on his ears. <sighs> Christmas is nothing to me. There was a time when it meant a great deal, but that was long ago. Fifty years is a long stretch to look back over. There is nothing in Christmas now, nothing for me at least. It is so long since Santa Claus remember me that I venture to say he has forgotten that there ever was such a person as Joel Baker in all the world. It used to be different. Santa Claus used to think a great deal of me when I was a boy. <sighs> Christmas nowadays, and what it was in the good old time. Nah, not what it used to be. As Joel was absorbed in his distressing thoughts, he became aware very suddenly that somebody was entering or trying to enter the room. First came a draught of cold air, then a scrapping, grating sound, then a strange shuffling, and then, yes, then all at once, Joel saw a pair of fat legs and a still fatter body dangle down the chimney, followed presently by a long white beard above which appeared a jolly red nose and two bright twinkling eyes while over the head and forehead was drawn a fur cap white with snowflakes ho ho chuckled the fat jolly stranger emerging from the chimney and standing well to one side of the hearthstone ho ho they don't have the big white chimney they used to build but they can keep Santa Claus out. No, they cannot keep Santa Claus out. Ho, ho, ho. Though the chimney were no bigger than the gas pipe, Santa Claus would slide down it. It didn't require a second glance to assure Joel that the newcomer was indeed Santa Claus. Joel knew the good old saint. And yes, he had seen him once before. And although that was when Joel was a little boy, he had never forgotten how Santa Claus looked. Nor had Santa Claus forgotten Joel, although Joel thought he had. For now Santa Claus looked kindly at Joel and smiled and said, Merry Christmas to you, Joel. Thank you, old Santa Claus, replied Joel. But I don't believe it's going to be a very Merry Christmas. It's been so long since I've had a Merry Christmas that I don't believe I know how to act if I had one. Let's see, said Santa Claus. It must be going on fifty years since I saw you last. 
Yes, you were eight years old the last time I slipped down the chimney of the old homestead and filled your stocking. Do you remember it? I remember it well, answered Joel. I had made up my mind to lie awake and see Santa Claus. I had heard tell of you, but I never seen you. And brother Otis and I concluded we'd lie awake and watch for you to come. Santa Claus shook his head reproachfully. That was very wrong, said he. For I'm so scared that if I known you boys were awake, I never have come down the chimney at all, and then you'd have had no presents. But Otis couldn't keep awake," explained Joel. "We talked about everything we could think of, until Father called out to us that if we didn't stop talking, he'd have to send one of us up into the attic to sleep with the hired man. So in less than five minutes, Otis was sound asleep, and no pinching could wake him up." But I was bound to see Santa Claus, and I don't believe anything would have put me to sleep. I heard the big clock in the sitting room strike eleven, and I had begun wondering if you never were going to come, when all of a sudden I heard the tinkle of the bells around your reindeer's necks. Then I heard the reindeer's prancing on the roof. And the sound of your sled runners cutting through the cross and slipping over the singles, I was kind of scared, and I covered my head up with a sheet and quilt. Only I left a little hole so I could peek out and see what was going on. As soon as I saw you, I got over being scared, for you were jolly and smiling like, and you chuckled as you went around to each stocking and filled it up. Yeah, I can remember the night," said Santa Claus. "I brought you a sled, didn't I?" "Yes, and you brought Otis one too," replied Joel. "Mine was red and had Yankee Doodle painted in black letters on the side. Uh, Otis was black and had Snow Queen in gilt letters." "I remember those sled distinctly," said Santa Claus. For I made them specially for you boys. You set the sleds up against the wall, continued Joel, and then you filled the stockings. There were six of them, as I recollect," said Santa Claus. "Let me see. There was mine, and Otis, and Elvira's, and Thankfuls, and Susan Prickett's. Susan was our help, you know. No, there were only five, and as I remember, they were the biggest that we could beg or borrow of on Dorcas, who weighed right onto two hundred pounds. Otis and I didn't like Susan Prickett, and we were hoping you put a cold potato in her stocking. But Susan was a good girl. Remonstrated Santa Claus. You know I put cold potatoes only in the stockings of boys and girls who are bad and don't believe in Santa Claus. At any rate," said Joel. "You filled all the stockings with candy and popcorn and nuts and raisins, and I can remember you said you were afraid you ran out of popcorn balls before you got around. Then you left each of us a book. Elvira got the best one, which was the Garland of Friendship." And had poems in it about the bleeding of hearts, and so forth. Father wasn't expecting anything, but you left him a new pair of mittens, and Mother got a new fur boa to wear to meeting. Of course," said Santa Claus. "I never forgot Father and Mother. Well, it was as much as I could do to lie still," continued Joel, "for I'd been longing for a sled." And the sight of that red sled with Yankee Doodle painted on it just made me wild. But somehow or other, I began to get powerful sleepy all at once, and I couldn't keep my eyes open. The next things I knew, Otis was nudging me in the ribs. "Get up, Joel," says he. 
It's Christmas and Santa Claus has been here. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We cried as we tumbled out of bed. Then Elvira and Thankful came in, not more than half-dressed, and Susan came in too, and we just made rum haul with Merry Christmas to each other. If you children don't make less noise in there, cried father, I'll have to send you all back to bed. The idea of asking boys and girls to keep quiet on Christmas morning when they've got new sleds and garland of friendship. Santa Claus chuckled. His rosy cheeks fairly beamed joy. Otis and I didn't want any breakfast, said Joel. We made up our minds that a stocking full of candy and popcorn and raisins would stay us for a while. I do believe there wasn't buckwheat cakes enough in the township to keep us indoors that morning. Buckwheat cakes don't size up much alongside of a red sled with Yankee Doodle painted onto it and a black sled named Snow Queen. We didn't care how cold it was, so much the better for sliding downhill. All the boys had new sleds. Leif Dawson, Bill Holbrook, Gum Adams, Rob Playford, Linda Merrick, Ezra Purple. All of them had new sleds except Martin Pavey. He said he calculated Santa Claus had skipped him this year because his father had broke his leg hauling logs from the Pelham woods and had been kept indoors six weeks. But Martin had his old sled, and he didn't have to ask any odds of any of us neither. I brought Martin the sled next Christmas, said Santa Claus. Like as not, but did you ever sled downhill, Santa Claus? I don't mean such hill as they have out here in this new country, but one of them old-fashioned New England hills that was made specially for boys to slide down. Full of bumpers and thank you moms and about ten times longer coming up than it is going down. The wind blew in our face and almost took our breath away. Merry Christmas to you little boys. It seemed to say and it untied our mufflers and whirled the snow in our faces. Just as if it was a boy too and wanted to play with us. And an old crow came flapping over us from the cornfield beyond the meadow. He said, go, go, when he saw my new sled. I suppose he never seen a red one before. Otis had a hard time with his sled, the black one, and he wondered why it wouldn't go as fast as mine would. Have you scrapped the paint off the runners? All worsely good now. Cause I have, said Otis. Broke my own knife and loot Ingraham at doing it. But it don't seem to make no difference. The darn old thing won't go. Then what did Simon Buzzle say but that, likes not, it was because Otis sled's name was Snow Queen. Never did see a girl sled that was worth a cent anyway, says Simon. Well, not that just about broke Otis up in business. It ain't a girl sled, says he. And its name ain't Snow Queen. I'm a going to call it Dan of Webster or Oliver Optic or Seraph Robbins or after some other big man. And the boys plague him so much about that pesky girl's lad that he scratched off the name. And as I remember, it did go better after that. About the only thing, continued Joel, that marred the harmony of the occasion as the editor of Hampshire County Phoenix used to say, was the ashes that Deacon Morris Frisbee sprung out in front of his house. He said he wasn't going to have folks breaking their necks, just on the count of a lot of frivolous boys that was going to gallows as fast as they could. Oh, how we hated him, and we have snowballed him too, if we hadn't been afraid of the constable that lived next door. But the ashes didn't bother us much, and every time we slid the side saddle, we'd give the ashes a kick, and that sort of scared them. The bare thought of this made Santa Claus laugh. Going on about nine o'clock, said Joel. The girls come along. Sister Alvira and Thankful, Prudence Tucker, Bill Yocum, Sophron Holbrook, Sis Hubbard, and Marthy Sawyer. Marty's brother increased 
wanted her to ride on his sled, but Marthy allowed that a red sled was her choice every time. I don't see how I'm going to hold on, said Marthy. Seems as if I would have my hands full keeping my things from blowing away. Don't worry about yourself, Marthy, says I. For if you'll look after your things, I kind of calculate I'll manage not to lose you on the way. Dear Marthy, seems as if I could see you now with your tangled hair blowing in the wind, your eyes all bright and sparkling, and your cheeks as red as apples. Seems to as if I could hear you laughing and calling just as you did as I told up the old New England hill that Christmas morning. A calling Joel 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 Ain't she ever coming Joel But the hill is long and steep Marthy And Joel ain't the boy he used to be He's old and grey and feeble But there's love and faith in his heart And they kind of keep him tottering toward the voice he hears a calling Joel 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 I know, I see it all, murmured Santa Claus very softly. Oh, that was so long ago, sighed Joel. So very long ago, and I've had no Christmas since, only once. When our little one, Marty's and mine, you remember him, Santa Claus? Yes. A toddling little boy with blue eyes. Like his mother, interrupted Joel. And who was like her too. So gentle and loving. Only we called him Joel. For that was my father's name. And it kind of ran in the family. I was more three years old when you came with your Christmas present for him, Santa Claus. We had told him about you. And he used to go to the chimney every night and make a little prayer about what he wanted you to bring him. And you brought them. A stick horse and a picture book and some blocks and a drum. They're on the shelf in the closet there and his little Christmas stocking with them. I've saved them all and I've taken them down and held them in my hands so many times. But when I came again, said Santa Claus. His little bed was empty, and I was alone. It killed his mother. Marthy was so tender-hearted. She kind of dropped and pined after that. So now they've been asleep side by side in the burying ground these 30 years. That's why I'm so sad, like, whenever Christmas comes, said Joel after a pause. The thinking of long ago makes me bitter almost. It's so different now from what it used to be. No, Joel, oh, no. This is the same world, and human nature is the same and always will be. But Christmas is for the little folks, and you, who are old and grizzled now, must know it and love it only through the gladness it brings the little ones. True. But how may I know and feel this gladness when I have no little stocking hanging in my chimney corner? No child to please me with his prattle. See? I am alone. No, you are not alone, Joel, said Santa Claus. There are children in this great city who would love and bless you for your goodness if you but touch their hearts. Make them happy, Joel. Send by me this night some gift to the little boy in the old house yonder. He is poor and sick. A simple toy will fill his Christmas with gladness. His little sister too. Take her some present, said Joel. Make them happy for me, Santa Claus. You are right. Make them happy for me. How sweetly Joel slept. When he awoke, the sunlight streamed in through the window and seemed to bid him a merry Christmas. How contented and happy Joel felt. It must have been the talk with Santa Claus that did it all. 
he had never known the sweeter sense of peace. A little girl came out of the house over the way. She had a new doll in her arms, and she sang a merry little song, and she laughed with joy as she skipped along the street. Aye, and at the window sat the little sick boy, and the toy Santa Claus left him, seemed to have brought him strength and health, for his eyes sparkled and his cheeks glowed, and it was plain to see his heart was full of happiness. And oh, how the chimes did ring out, and how joyfully they sung their Christmas carol that morning. They sang of Bethlehem, and the manger, and the babe. They sang of love and charity, till all the Christmas air seemed full of angel voices. Carol of the Christmas morning, carol of the Christ child born, carol to the listening sky, till it echoes back again. Glory be to God on high, peace on earth, God will toward men. So all this music, the carol of the chimes, the sound of children's voices, the smile of the poor little boy over the way, all this sweet music crept into Joel's heart that Christmas morning. Yes, and with this sweet holy influence, came others so subtle and divine that in its silent communion with them joel's heart cried out amen and amen to the glory of the christmas time end of the joel's talk with santa claus the three kings of cologne by eugene field Read for LibriVox.org by Betty B. From out Cologne there came three kings to worship Jesus Christ, their king. To him they sought fine herbs they brought, and many a beauteous golden thing. They brought their gifts to Bethlehem town, and in that manger set them down. Then spake the first king, and he said, O child most heavenly, bright and fair, i bring this crown to bethlehem town for thee and only thee to wear so give a heavenly crown to me when i shall come at last to thee the second then i bring thee here this royal robe o child he cried of silk tis spun and such an one there is not in the world beside so in the day of doom requite me with a heavenly robe of white the third king gave his gift and quoth spikenard and myrrh to thee i bring and with these twain would i most fain anoint the body of my king so may their incense sometime rise to plead for me in yonder skies thus spake the three kings of cologne that gave their gifts and went their way and now kneel i in prayer hard by the cradle of the child to-day nor crown nor robe nor spice i bring as offering unto christ my king yet i have brought a gift the child may not despise however small for here i lay my heart to-day and it is full of love to all take thou the poor but loyal thing my only tribute christ my king end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Coming of the Prince of Christmas Tales and Christmas Verse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne. Christmas Tales and Christmas Verse by Eugene Field. The Coming of the Prince. Whirr, 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 said the wind, and it tore through the streets of the city that Christmas Eve, turning umbrellas inside out, driving the snow in fitful gusts before it, creaking the rusty signs and shutters, and playing every kind of rude prank it could think of. How cold your breath is tonight, said Barbara with a shiver, as she drew her tattered little shawl the closer around her benumbed body. Whirr! answered the wind but why are you out in this storm 
You should be at home by the warm fire. I have no home, said Barbara, and then she sighed bitterly, and something like a tiny pearl came in the corner of one of her sad blue eyes. But the wind did not hear her answer, for it had hurried up the street to throw a handful of snow in the face of an old man who was struggling along with a huge basket of good things on each arm. Why are you not at the cathedral? asked a snowflake as it alighted on Barbara's shoulder. I heard grand music and saw beautiful lights there as I floated down from the sky a moment ago. What are they doing at the cathedral? inquired Barbara. Why, haven't you heard? exclaimed the snowflake. I supposed everybody knew that the prince was coming tomorrow. Surely enough, this is Christmas Eve, said Barbara, and the prince will come tomorrow. Barbara remembered that her mother had told her about the prince, how beautiful and good and kind and gentle he was, and how he loved the little children. But her mother was dead now, and there was none to tell Barbara of the prince and his coming, none but the little snowflake. I should like to see the prince, said Barbara for I have heard he was very beautiful and good. That he is, said the snowflake. I have never seen him, but I heard the pines and the firs singing about him as I floated over the forest tonight. Whoo! Whoo! cried the wind, returning boisterously to where Barbara stood. I've been looking for you everywhere, little snowflake. So come with me and without any further ado, the wind seized upon the snowflake and hurried it along the street, and led it a merry dance through the icy air of the winter night. Barbara trudged on through the snow and looked in at the bright things in the shop windows, the glitter of the lights and the sparkle of the vast array of beautiful Christmas toys quite dazzled her. A strange mingling of admiration, regret, and envy filled the poor little creature's heart. Much as I may yearn to have them, it cannot be, she said to herself. Yet I may feast my eyes upon them. Go away from here, said a harsh voice. How can the rich people see all my fine things if you stand before the window? Be off with you, you miserable little beggar. It was the shopkeeper, and he gave Barbara a savage box in the ear that sent her reeling into the deeper snowdrifts of the gutter. Presently, she came to a large house, where there seemed to be much mirth and festivity. The shutters were thrown open, and through the windows Barbara could see a beautiful Christmas tree in the center of a spacious room. A beautiful Christmas tree ablaze with red and green lights, and heavy with toys and stars and glass balls and other beautiful things that children love. There was a merry throng around the tree, and the children were smiling and gleeful and all in that house seemed content and happy. Barbara heard them singing, and their song was about the prince who was to come on the morrow. This must be the house where the prince will stop, thought Barbara. How I would like to see his face and hear his voice, yet what would he care for me, a miserable little beggar? So Barbara crept on through the storm, shivering and disconsolate, yet thinking of the prince. "'Where are you going?' she asked of the wind as it overtook her. "'To the cathedral,' laughed the wind. "'The great people are flocking there, and I will have a merry time amongst them. Ha, ha, ha!' And with laughter the wind whirled away and chased the snow toward the cathedral. "'It is there, then, that the prince will come,' thought Barbara. "'It is a beautiful place, and the people will pay him homage there.' Perhaps I shall see him if I go there. So she went to the cathedral. Many folk were there in their richest apparel, and the organ rolled out its grand music, and the people sang wondrous songs, and the priests made eloquent prayers, and the music and the songs and the prayers were all about the prince and his expected coming. The throng that swept in and out of the great edifice talked always of the prince, the prince, the prince until Barbara really loved him very much, for all the gentle words she heard the people say of him. "'Please, can I go and sit inside?' inquired Barbara of the sexton. 
No, said the sexton gruffly, for this was an important occasion with the sexton, and he had no idea of wasting words on a beggar child. But I will be very good and quiet, pleaded Barbara. Please, may I not see the prince? I have said no, and I mean it, retorted the sexton. What have you for the prince, or what cares the prince for you? Out with you, and don't be blocking up the doorway. So the sexton gave Barbara an angry push, and the child fell halfway down the icy steps of the cathedral. She began to cry. Some great people were entering the cathedral at the time, and they laughed to see her falling. Have you seen the prince? inquired a snowflake, alighting on Barbara's cheek. It was the same little snowflake that had clung to her shawl an hour ago, when the wind came galloping along on his boisterous search. Ah, uh, no, sighed Barbara in tears. But what cares the prince for me? Do not speak so bitterly, said the little snowflake. Go to the forest, and you shall see him, for the prince always comes through the forest to the city. Despite the cold and her bruises and her tears, Barbara smiled. In the forest she could behold the prince coming on his way, and he would not see her, for she would hide among the trees and vines. It was the mischievous, romping wind once more, and it fluttered Barbara's tattered shawl and set her hair to streaming in every direction, and swept a snowflake from her cheek and sent it spinning through the air. Barbara trudged toward the forest, when she came to the city gate, the watchman stopped her and held his big lantern in her face and asked her who she was and where she was going. I am Barbara, and I'm going into the forest, she said boldly. Into the forest, cried the watchman, and in this storm? No, child, you will perish. But I am going to see the prince, said Barbara. They will not let me watch for him in the church nor in any of their pleasant homes, so I'm going into the forest. The watchman smiled sadly. He was a kindly man. He thought of his own little girl at home. No, you must not go to the forest, said he, for you would perish with the cold. But Barbara would not stay. She avoided the watchman's grasp and ran as fast as ever she could through the city gate. Come back! Come back! cried the watchman. You will perish in the forest. But Barbara would not heed his cry. The falling snow did not stay her, nor did the cutting blast. She thought only of the prince, and she ran straight away to the forest. What do you see up there, O pine tree? asked a little vine in the forest. You lift your head among the clouds tonight, and you tremble strangely as if you saw wondrous sights. I see only the distant hilltops and the dark clouds answered the pine tree, and the wind sings of the snow king tonight. To all my questionings he says, snow, 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 till I'm wearied with his refrain. But the prince will surely come tomorrow, inquired the tiny snowdrop that nestled close to the vine. Oh, yes, said the vine. I heard the country folks talking about it as they went through the forest today, and they said that the prince would surely come on the morrow. What are you little folks down there talking about? asked the pine tree. We're talking about the prince, said the vine. Yes, he is to come on the morrow, said the pine tree, but not until the day dawns, and it is still all dark in the east. Yes, said the fir tree, the east is black, and only the wind and the snow issue from it. Keep your head out of my way, cried the pine tree to the fir. With your constant bobbing around, I can hardly see at all. Take that for your bad manners, retorted the fir, slapping the pine tree savagely with one of her longest branches. The pine tree would put up with no such treatment, so he hurled his largest cone at the fir, and for a moment or two it looked as if there were going to be a serious commotion in the forest. Hush! cried the vine in a startled tone. There is someone coming through the forest. The pine tree and the fir stopped quarreling, and the snowdrop nestled closer to the vine, while the vine hugged the pine tree very tightly. All were greatly alarmed. 
Nonsense, said the pine tree in a tone of assumed bravery. No one would venture into the forest at such an hour. Indeed, and why not? cried a child's voice. Will you not let me watch with you for the coming of the prince? Will you not chop me down? inquired the pine tree gruffly. Will you not tear me from my tree? asked the vine. Will you not pluck my blossoms? plaintively piped the snowdrop. No, of course not, said Barbara. I have come only to watch with you for the prince. Then Barbara told them who she was, and how cruelly she had been treated in the city, and how she longed to see the prince, who was to come on the morrow. And as she talked, the forest and all therein felt a great compassion for her. Lie at my feet, said the pine tree, and I will protect you. Nestle close to me, and I will chafe your temples and body and limbs till they are warm, said the vine. Let me rest upon your cheek, and I will sing you my little songs, said the snowdrop. And Barbara felt very grateful for all these homely kindnesses. She rested in the velvety snow at the foot of the pine tree, and the vine chafed her body and limbs, and the little flower sang sweet songs to her. <sighs> there was that noisy wind again, but this time it was gentler than it had been in the city. Here you are, my little Barbara, said the wind in kindly tones. I have brought you the little snowflake. I am glad you came away from the city, for the people are proud and haughty there. Oh, but I will have my fun with them. Then, having dropped the little snowflake on Barbara's cheek, the wind whisked off to the city again, and we can imagine that it played rare pranks with the proud, haughty folk on his return, for the wind, as you know, is no respecter of persons. Dear Barbara, said the snowflake, I will watch with thee for the coming of the prince. And Barbara was glad, for she loved the little snowflake that was so pure and innocent and gentle. Tell us, O pine tree, cried the vine, what do you see in the east? Has the prince yet entered the forest? The east is full of black clouds, said the pine tree and the winds that hurry it to the hilltop sing of the snow. But the city is full of brightness, said the fir. I can see the lights in the cathedral, and I can hear wondrous music about the prince and his coming. Yes, they are singing of the prince in the cathedral, said Barbara sadly. But we shall see him first, whispered the vine reassuringly. Yes, the prince will come through the forest said the little snowdrop gleefully. Fear not, dear Barbara, we shall behold the prince in all his glory, cried the snowflake. Then all at once there was a strange hubbub in the forest, for it was midnight, and the spirits came from their hiding places to prowl about and to disport themselves. Barbara beheld them all in great wonder and trepidation, for she had never before seen the spirits of the forest, although she had often heard of them, it was a marvellous sight. So Barbara fell asleep. Fear nothing, whispered the vine to Barbara. Fear nothing, for they dare not touch you. The antics of the wood spirits continued but an hour, for then a cock crowed, and immediately thereat, with a wondrous scurrying, the elves and the gnomes and the other grotesque spirits sought their abiding places in the caves and in the hollow trunks and under the loose bark of the trees and then it was very quiet once more in the forest. It is very cold, said Barbara. My hands and feet are like ice. Then the pine tree and the fir shook down the snow from their broad boughs, and the snow fell upon Barbara and covered her like a white mantle. You'll be warm now, said the vine, kissing Barbara's forehead, and Barbara smiled. Then the snowdrop sang a lullaby about the moss that loved the violet. And Barbara said, I am going to sleep. Will you wake me when the prince comes through the forest? And they said they would. So Barbara fell asleep. The bells in the city are ringing merrily, said the fir, and the music in the cathedral is louder and more beautiful than before. Can it be that the prince has already come into the city? 
No, cried the pine tree. Look to the east and see the Christmas day a dawning. The prince is coming, and his pathway is through the forest. The storm had ceased. Snow lay upon all the earth. The hills, the forest, the city, and the meadows were white with the robe the storm king had thrown over them. Content with his wondrous work, the storm king himself had fled to his far northern home before the dawn of the Christmas day. Everything was bright and sparkling and beautiful, and most beautiful was the great hymn of praise the forest sang that Christmas morning. The pine trees and the firs and the vines and the snow flowers that sang of the prince and of his promised coming. Wake up, little one, cried the vine, for the prince is coming. But Barbara slept. She did not hear the vine's soft calling nor the lofty music of the forest. A little snowbird flew down from the fir tree's bough and perched upon the vine, and caroled in Barbara's ear of the Christmas morning and of the coming of the prince. But Barbara slept. She did not hear the carol of the bird. Alas, sighed the vine, Barbara will not awaken, and the prince is coming. Then the vine and the snowdrop wept, and the pine tree and the fir were very sad. The prince came through the forest clad in royal raiment and wearing a golden crown. Angels came with him, and the forest sang a great hymn unto the prince, such a hymn as had never before been heard on earth. The prince came to the sleeping child and smiled upon her, and called her by name. Barbara, my little one, said the prince, awaken and come with me. Then Barbara opened her eyes and beheld the prince, and it seemed as if a new life had come to her, for there was warmth in her body and a flush upon her cheeks and a light in her eyes that were divine, and she was clothed no longer in rags, but in white flowing raiment, and upon the soft brown hair there was a crown like those which angels wear. And as Barbara arose and went to the prince, the little snowflake fell from her cheek upon her bosom, and forthwith became a pearl more precious than all other jewels upon earth. And the prince took Barbara in his arms and blessed her, and turning round about, returned with the little child unto his home, while the forest and the sky and the angel sang a wondrous song. The city waited for the prince, but he did not come. None knew of the glory of the forest that Christmas morning, nor of the new life that came to little Barbara. Come thou, dear prince, oh, come to us this holy Christmas time. Come to the busy marts of earth, the quiet homes, the noisy streets, the humble lanes. Come to us all, and with thy love touch every human heart, that we may know that love and in its blessed peace, bear charity to all mankind. End of The Coming of the Prince Christmas of Old by Eugene Field Recorded for LibriVox.org by Kangaroo God rest you, Kristen, gentlemen, wherever you may be, God rest you, all in field or hall, or on ye stormy sea. For on this morn our Christ is born, that saveth you and me. Last night ye shepherds in ye east saw many a wondrous thing. Ye sky last night flamed passing bright, whiles that ye stars did sing. And angels came to bless ye name, of Jesus Christ, our King. God rest ye, Christian gentlemen, fain where'er you may. In noblest court do thou no sport, in tournament no play. In Paynim lands howled thou thy hands from bloudy works this day. But thinking on ye, gentle Lord, that died upon ye tree, let troubling cease and deeds of peace abound in Christian chi. For on this morn ye Christ is born, it saveth you and me.
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mouse and the Moonbeam of Christmas Tales and Christmas Verse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne. Christmas Tales and Christmas Verse by Eugene Field. The Mouse and the Moonbeam. Whilst you were sleeping, little dear my soul, strange things happened, but that I saw and heard them I should never have believed them. The clock stood, of course, in the corner, a moonbeam floated idly on the floor, and a little mauve mouse came from the hole in the chimney corner and frisked and scampered in the light of the moonbeam upon the floor. The little mauve mouse was particularly merry. Sometimes she danced upon two legs and sometimes upon four legs but always very daintily, and always very merrily. "'Ah, me!' sighed the old clock. "'How different mice are nowadays from the mice we used to have in the good old times. Now there was your grandma, Mistress Velvetpaw, and there was your grandpa, Master Sniffwhisker. How grave and dignified they were! Many a night have I seen them dancing upon the carpet below me, but always the stately minuet and never that crazy frisking which you are executing now, to my surprise, yes, and to my horror, too. But why shouldn't I be merry? asked the little mauve mouse. Tomorrow is Christmas, and this is Christmas Eve. So it is, said the old clock. I had really forgotten all about it. But tell me, what is Christmas to you, little Miss Mauve Mouse? "'A great deal to me,' cried the little mauve mouse. "'I have been very good a very long time. "'I have not used any bad words, nor have I gnawed any holes, "'nor have I stolen any canary seed, "'nor have I worried my mother by running behind the flower barrel "'where that horrid trap is set. "'In fact, I have been so good that I am very sure Santa Claus will bring me something very pretty.' This seemed to amuse the old clock mightily. In fact, the old clock fell to laughing so heartily that in an unguarded moment she struck twelve instead of ten, which was exceedingly careless and therefore to be reprehended. "'Why, you silly little mauve mouse,' said the old clock, "'you don't believe in Santa Claus, do you?' "'Of course I do,' answered the little mauve mouse. "'Believe in Santa Claus?' Why shouldn't I? Didn't Santa Claus bring me a beautiful buttercracker last Christmas, and a lovely ginger snap, and a delicious rind of cheese, and, and lots of things? I should be very ungrateful if I did not believe in Santa Claus, and I certainly shall not disbelieve in him at the very moment when I am expecting him to arrive with a bundle of goodies for me. I once had a little sister, continued the little mauve mouse, who did not believe in Santa Claus, and the very thought of the fate that befell her makes my blood run cold and my whiskers stand on end. She died before I was born, but my mother has told me all about her. Perhaps you never saw her. Her name was Squeak Nibble, and she was in stature one of those long, low, rangy mice that are seldom found in well-stocked pantries. Mother says that Squeak Nibble took after our ancestors who came from New England, where the malignant ingenuity of the people and the ferocity of the cats rendered life precarious indeed. Squeak Nibble seemed to inherit many ancestral traits, the most conspicuous of which was a disposition to sneer at some of the most respected dogmas in Mousedom. From her very infancy she doubted, for example, the widely accepted theory that the moon was composed of green cheese, and this heresy was the first intimation her parents had of the sceptical turn of her mind. Of course, her parents were vastly annoyed, for their maturer natures saw that this youthful scepticism portended serious, if not fatal, consequences. Yet all in vain did the sagacious couple reason and plead with their headstrong and heretical child. For a long time Squeak Nibble would not believe that there was any such orcafind as a cat. 
but she came to be convinced to the contrary one memorable night, on which occasion she lost two inches of her beautiful tail, and received so terrible a fright that for fully an hour afterward her little heart beat so violently as to lift her off her feet and bump her head against the top of our domestic hole. The cat that deprived my sister of so large a percentage of her vertebral colophon was the same brindled ogress that nowadays steals ever and anon into this room, crouches treacherously behind the sofa, and feigns to be asleep, hoping, forsooth, that some of us, heedless of her hated presence, will venture within reach of her diabolical claws. So enraged was this ferocious monster at the escape of my sister that she ground her fangs viciously together, and vowed to take no pleasure in life until she held in her devouring jaws the innocent little mouse which belonged to the mangled bit of tail she even then clutched in her remorseless claws. Yes, said the old clock, now that you recall the incident, I recollect it well. I was here then, in this very corner, and I remember that I laughed at the cat and chided her for her awkwardness. My reproaches irritated her. She told me that a clock's duty was to run itself down, not to be deprecating the merits of others. Yes, I recall the time. That cat's tongue is fully as sharp as her claws. Be that as it may, said the little mauve mouse. It is a matter of history, and therefore beyond dispute, that from that very moment the cat pined for Squeak Nibble's life. It seemed as if that one little two-inch taste of Squeak Nibble's tail had filled the cat with a consuming passion, or appetite, for the rest of Squeak Nibble. So the cat waited and watched and hunted and schemed and devised and did everything possible for a cat, a cruel cat, to do in order to gain her murderous ends. One night, one fatal Christmas Eve, our mother had undressed the children for bed, and was urging upon them to go to sleep earlier than usual, since she fully expected that Santa Claus would bring each of them something very palatable and nice before morning. Thereupon the little dears whisked their cunning tails, pricked up their beautiful ears, and began telling one another what they hoped Santa Claus would bring. One asked for a slice of Roquefort, another for Neufchatel, another for Sapsago, and a fourth for Edam. One expressed a preference for debris, while another hoped to get Parmesan. One clamoured for imperial blue Stilton, and another craved the fragrant boon of Caprera. There were fourteen little ones then, and consequently there were diverse opinions as to the kind of gift which Santa Claus should best bring. Still, there was, as you can readily understand, an enthusiastic unanimity upon this point, namely, that the gift should be cheese of some brand or other. My dears, said our mother, what matters is whether the boon which Santa Claus brings be royal English cheddar, or fromage du brick Quebec, Vermont sage, or Herkimer County skim milk. We should be content with whatsoever Santa Claus bestows, so long as it be cheese disjoined from all traps whatsoever, unmixed with Paris green, and free from glass, strychnine, and other harmful ingredients. As for myself, I shall be satisfied with a cast of nice, fresh western reserve. For truly I recognize in no other viand or edible half the fragrance or half the gustfulness to be met with in one of these pale but aromatic domestic products. So run away to your dreams now, that Santa Claus may find you sleeping. The children obeyed, all oh, but Squeak Nibble. Let the others think what they please, said she. But I don't believe in Santa Claus. I'm not going to bed either. I'm going to creep out of this dark hole and have a quiet romp, all by myself, in the moonlight. Oh, what a vain, foolish, wicked little mouse was Squeak Nibble. But I will not reproach the dead. Her punishment came all too swiftly. Now listen, who do you suppose overheard her talking so disrespectfully of Santa Claus? Why, Santa Claus himself, said the old clock. Oh, no, answered the little mauve mouse. 
it was that wicked, murderous cat. Just as Satan lurks and lies in wait for bad children, so does the cruel cat look and lie in wait for naughty little mice. And you can depend upon it that, when that awful cat heard Squeak Nibble speak so disrespectfully of Santa Claus, her wicked eyes glowed with joy, her sharp teeth watered, and her bristling fur emitted electric sparks as big as marrow fat peas. Then what did that bloodthirsty monster do but scuttle as fast as she could into dear my soul's room, leap up into dear my soul's crib, and walk off with the pretty little white muff, which dear my soul used to wear when she went for a visit to the little girl in the next block? What upon earth did the horrid old cat want with dear my soul's pretty little white muff? Ah, the duplicity! the diabolical ingenuity of that cat. Listen, in the first place, resumed the little mauve mouse, after a pause that testified eloquently to the depth of her emotion, in the first place, that wretched cat dressed herself up in that pretty little white muff, by which you are to understand that she crawled through the muff just so far as to leave her four cruel legs at liberty. Yes, I understand, said the old clock. Then she put on the boy doll's fur cap, said the little mauve mouse. And when she was arrayed in the boy doll's fur cap and dear my soul's pretty little white muff, of course she didn't look like a cruel cat at all. But whom did she look like? Like the boy doll, suggested the old clock. No, no, cried the little mauve mouse. Like dear my soul, asked the old clock. "'How stupid you are!' exclaimed the little mole mouse. "'Why, she looked like Santa Claus, of course.' "'Oh, yes, I see,' said the old clock. "'Now I begin to be interested. Go on.' "'Alas!' sighed the little mole mouse. "'Not much remains to be told, "'but there is more of my story left than there was of Squeak Nibble "'when that horrid cat crawled out of that miserable disguise.' You are to understand that, contrary to her sagacious mother's injunction, and in notorious derision of the mooted coming of Santa Claus, Squeak Nibble issued from the friendly hole in the chimney corner, and gambled about over this very carpet, and, I dare say, in this very moonlight. I do not know, said the moonbeam faintly. I am so very old, and I have seen so many things. I do not know. Right merrily was Squeak Nibble gamboling, continued the little mauve mouse, and she had just turned a double back somersault without the use of what remained of her tail, when, all of a sudden, she beheld, looming up like a monster ghost, a figure all in white fur. Oh, how frightened she was, and how her little heart did beat! Purr, purr, said the ghost in white fur. Oh, please don't hurt me! pleaded Squeak Nibble. No, I'll not hurt you, said the ghost in white fur. I'm Santa Claus, and I brought you a beautiful piece of savory old cheese, you dear little mousy you. Poor Squeak Nibble was deceived. A skeptic all her life, she was at last befooled by the most palpable and most fatal of frauds. How good of you, said Squeak Nibble. I didn't believe there was a Santa Claus, and... But before she could say more, she was seized by two sharp, cruel claws that conveyed her crushed body into the murderous mouse of Mousedom's most malignant foe. I can dwell no longer upon this harrowing scene. Suffice it to say that ere the morrow's sun rose like a big yellow Herkimer County cheese upon the spot where that tragedy had been enacted, poor Squeak Nibble passed to that bourne whence two inches of her beautiful tail had preceded her by the space of three weeks and a day. As for Santa Claus, when he came that Christmas Eve, bringing morceaux de brie and of stilton for the other little mice, he heard with sorrow of Squeak Nibble's fate, and ere he departed he said that in all his experiences he had never known of a mouse or of a child that has prospered after once saying that he didn't believe in Santa Claus. 
"'Well, that is a remarkable story,' said the old clock. "'But if you believe in Santa Claus, why aren't you in bed?' "'That's where I shall be presently,' answered the little mauve mouse. "'But I must have my scamper, you know. "'It is very pleasant, I assure you, to frolic in the light of the moon. "'Only I cannot understand why you are always so cold and so solemn and so still.' "'You pale, pretty little moonbeam!' "'Indeed, I do not know that I am so,' said the moonbeam. "'But I am very old, and I have travelled many, many leagues, "'and I have seen wondrous things. "'Sometimes I toss upon the ocean, "'sometimes I fall upon a slumbering flower, "'sometimes I rest upon a dead child's face. "'I see the fairies at their play, "'and I hear mothers singing lullabies.' Last night I swept across the frozen bosom of a river. A woman's face looked up at me. It was the picture of eternal rest. She is sleeping, said the frozen river. I rock her to and fro and sing to her. Pass gently by, O moonbeam. Pass gently by, lest you awaken her. How strangely you talk, said the old clock. Now... I'll warrant me that, if you wanted to, you could tell many a pretty and wonderful story. You must know many a Christmas tale. Pray, tell us one, to wear away this night of Christmas watching. I know but one, said the moonbeam. I have told it over and over again, in every land and in every home. Yet I do not weary of it. It is very simple. Should you like to hear it? "'Indeed we should,' said the old clock. "'But before you begin, let me strike twelve, "'for I shouldn't want to interrupt you.' "'When the old clock had performed this duty "'with somewhat more than unusual alacrity, "'the moonbeam began its story. "'Once upon a time, so long ago "'that I can't tell how long ago it was, "'I fell upon a hillside. "'It was in a far distant country. "'This I know, because... Although it was the Christmas time, it was not in that country, as it is wont to be in countries to the north. Hither the Snow King never came. Flowers bloomed all the year, and at all times the lambs found pleasant pasture on the hillsides. The night wind was balmy, and there was a fragrance of cedar in its breath. There were violets on the hillside, and I fell amongst them and lay there. I kissed them and they awakened. Ah, is it you, little moonbeam? They said, and they nestled in the grass which the lambs had left uncropped. A shepherd lay upon a broad stone on the hillside. Above him spread an olive tree, old, ragged and gloomy, but now it swayed its rusty branches majestically in the shifting air of night. The shepherd's name was Benoni. Wearied with long watching, he had fallen asleep. His crook had slipped from his hand. Upon the hillside, too, slept the shepherd's flock. I had counted them again and again. I had stolen across their gentle faces and brought them pleasant dreams of green pastures and of cool water brooks. I had kissed old Benoni, too, as he lay slumbering there, and in his dreams he seemed to see Israel's king come upon earth, and in his dreams he murmured the promised Messiah's name. "'Ah, is it you, little moonbeam?' quoth the violets. "'You have come in good time. Nestle here with us, and see wonderful things come to pass.' "'What are all these wonderful things of which you speak?' I asked. We heard the old olive tree telling of them tonight, said the violets. Do not go to sleep, little violets, said the old olive tree, for this is Christmas night, and the master shall walk upon the hillside in the glory of the midnight hour. So we waited and watched. One by one the lambs fell asleep. One by one the stars peeped out. The shepherd nodded and crooned and crooned and nodded, and at last he, too, went fast asleep. "'and his crook slipped from his keeping. 
Then we called to the old olive tree yonder, asking how soon the midnight hour would come. But all the old olive tree answered was, Presently, presently. And finally we too fell asleep, wearied by our long watching, and lulled by the rocking and swaying of the old olive tree in the breezes of the night. But who is this master? I asked. A child, a little child, they answered. He is called the little master by the others. He comes here often and plays among the flowers of the hillside. Sometimes the lambs, gambling too carelessly, have crushed and bruised us so that we lie bleeding and are like to die. But the little master heals our wounds and refreshes us once again. I marveled much to hear these things. The midnight hour is at hand, said I, and I will abide with you to see this little master of whom you speak. So we nestled among the verdure of the hillside and sang songs one to another. Come away, called the night wind. I know a beauteous sea not far hence, upon whose bosom you shall float, float, float away out into the mists and clouds, if you will come with me. But I hid under the violets and amid the tall grass, that the night wind might not woo me with its pleading. Ho oh, there, old olive tree, cried the violets. Do you see the little master coming? Is not the midnight hour at hand? I can see the town yonder, said the old olive tree. A star beams bright over Bethlehem. The iron gates swing open and the little master comes. Two children came to the hillside. The one, older than his comrade, was Damas, the son of Benoni. He was rugged and sinewy, and over his brown shoulders was flung a goatskin. A leather cap did not confine his long, dark, curly hair. The other child was he whom they called the little master. About his slender form clung raiment white as snow, and around his face of heavenly innocence fell curls of golden yellow. So beautiful a child I had not seen before, nor have I ever since seen such as he. And as they came together to the hillside, there seemed to glow about the little master's head a soft white light, as if the moon had sent its tenderest, fairest beams to kiss those golden curls. "'What sound was that?' cried Damas, for he was exceeding fearful. "'Have no fear, Damas,' said the little master. "'Give me thy hand, and I will lead thee.' Presently they came to the rock whereon Benoni the shepherd lay, and they stood under the old olive tree, and the old olive tree swayed no longer in the night wind, but bent its branches reverently in the presence of the little master. It seemed as if the wind, too, stayed in its shifting course just then, for suddenly there was a solemn hush, and you could hear no noise, except that in his dreams Benoni spoke the Messiah's name. Thy father sleeps, said the little master, and it is well that it is so, for that I love thee, Dimas, and that thou shalt walk with me in my father's kingdom. I would show thee the glories of my birthright. Then all at once sweet music filled the air, and light greater than the light of day illumined the sky and fell upon all that hillside. The heavens opened, and angels singing joyous songs walked to the earth. More wondrous still, the stars falling from their places in the sky clustered upon the old olive tree and swung hither and thither like colored lanterns. The flowers of the hillside all awakened, and they too danced and sang. The angels coming hither hung gold and silver and jewels and precious stones upon the old olive where swung the stars, so that the glory of that sight, though I might live for ever, I shall never see again. When Damas heard and saw these things, he fell upon his knees, and catching the hem of the little master's garment, 
he kissed it. Greater joy than this be thine, Damas, said the little master. But first must all things be fulfilled. All through that Christmas night did the angels come and go with their sweet anthems. All through that Christmas night did the stars dance and sing. And when it came my time to steal away, the hillside was still beautiful with the glory and the music of heaven. Well, is that all? asked the old clock. No, said the moonbeam, but I am nearly done. The years went on. Sometimes I tossed upon the ocean's bosom. Sometimes I scampered over a battlefield. Sometimes I lay upon a dead child's face. I heard the voices of darkness and mother's lullabies and sick men's prayers. And so the years went on. I fell one night upon a hard and furrowed face. It was of ghostly pallor. A thief was dying on the cross. And this was his wretched face. About the cross stood men with staves and swords and spears. But none paid heed unto the thief. Somewhat beyond this cross another was lifted up. And upon it was stretched a human body my light fell not upon. But I heard a voice that somewhere I had heard before. Though where I did not know. And this voice blessed those that railed and jeered and shamefully entreated. And suddenly the voice called, Damas, Damas. And the thief upon whose hardened face I rested made answer. Then I saw that it was Damas. Yet to this wicked criminal there remained but little of the shepherd child whom I had seen in all his innocence upon the hillside. Long years of sinful life had seared their marks into his face. Yet now, at the sound of that familiar voice, somewhat of the old-time boyish look came back, and in the yearning of the anguished eyes I seemed to see the shepherd's son again. The master, cried Damas, and he stretched forth his neck that he might see him that spake. O oh, Damas, how art thou changed? cried the master. Yet there was in his voice no tone of rebuke save that which cometh of love. Then Damas wept, and in that hour he forgot his pain. And the master's consoling voice and the master's presence there wrought in the dying criminal such a new spirit that when at last his head fell upon his bosom, and the men about the cross said that he was dead. It seemed as if I shined not upon a felon's face, but upon the face of a gentle shepherd lad, the son of Benoni. And shining on that dead and peaceful face, I bethought me of the little master's word that he had spoken under the old olive tree upon the hillside, your eyes behold the promised glory now, O Damas, I whispered, for with the master you walk in paradise. Ah, little dear my soul, you know, you know whereof the moonbeam spake. The shepherd's bones are dust, the flocks are scattered, the old olive tree is gone, the flowers of the hillside are withered, and none knoweth where the grave of Damas is made. But last night again there shined a star over Bethlehem, and the angel descended from the sky to earth, and the stars sang together in glory, and the bells hear them, little dear my soul, how sweetly they are ringing. The bells bear us the good tidings of great joy this Christmas morning, that our Christ is born, and that with him he bringeth peace on earth and good will toward men. End of The Mouse and the Moonbeam Christmas Morning by Eugene Field Read 
for LibriVox.org by Kangaroo. The angel host that sped last night, bearing the wondrous news afar, came in their ever glorious flight unto a slumbering little star. Awake and sing, O star, they cried. Awake and glorify the morn. Herald the tidings far and wide. He that shall lead his flock is born. The little star awoke and sung, as only stars in rapture may. And presently where church bells hung, the joyous tidings found their way. Awake, O bells, tis Christmas morn. Awake and let thy music tell to all mankind that now is born what shepherd loves his lambkins well. Then ring the bells as fled the night or dreaming land and drowsing deep and coming with the morning light they called my child to you asleep. Sweetly and tenderly they spoke and lingering round your little bed their music pleaded till you woke and this is what their music said. Awake and sing, tis Christmas morn, whereon all earth salutes her king. In Bethlehem is the shepherd born. Awake, O little lamb, and sing. So, dear child, kneel at my feet, and with those voices from above, share thou this holy time with me, the universal hymn of love. December 25th, 1890 End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.